Okay, let's talk about Coulomb's law. So if we have two charged particles <coughs> existing in space, they will create forces on each other. And the magnitude of that force is given by this formula. So Q1 and Q2 are our, the amount of charge we have at these two different locations. R here is the distance between them. Epsilon not here. It's called the permittivity of free space. We'll talk about that in a second. I want you to notice this is really important here, however. This formula only gives us the magnitude of the force. Doesn't tell us the direction of the force. We have to use the picture to figure out the direction. We never, ever, ever plug negative numbers into this formula. Notice we got these absolute value bars here. This will never spit out something negative. This magnitude's always positive. This only tells us how strong the force is. We have to use the picture to figure out if we're going to have a positive, a negative, east, west, north, south, whatever. How do we do that? By using opposites attract and likes repel. <coughs> and when we have multiple forces, using what's called the superposition of forces or superposition of vectors. So if I had these two charges here separated by this distance r, this would be the force of 1 on 2. That's what this notation means. The electric force of charge 1 acting on charge 2. That would point him to the right. This guy is the force of 2 acting on 1. It would push him to the left. That's a third law pair there. This guy... They push on each other. He's being pushed to the right. He's being pushed to the left with equal and opposite force. If our char charges were opposite in nature, then they would attract. But we would use this formula in all four cases to find the magnitude of these vectors. Use the picture to determine whether we want to point left, right, up or down, whatever it is. Okay, so we just talked about epsilon naught. That is this number. That's kind of, in a sense, the bendability, the electric bendability of space itself. So we could think of the electric field as kind of, you put a charge in space and that bends space everywhere. And then if you put another charge in that bent space, it will react to bent space-time. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's a lot like gravity. And just like we had in Physics 1, that gravitational constant, Newton's universal gravitational constant, epsilon naught is like that, but for electric forces. So this formula we have is literally the same formula we had in Physics 1 for the gravitational force between two masses. Only instead of having mass 1 and mass 2 and capital G here, we have the electrical equivalent to mass charge. Now, there's no such thing as negative mass, so we didn't have to worry about absolute value for gravity. But there are negative charges here, so we do need absolute value. Gravity is always attractive. The electric force could be attractive or repulsive. So again, this number right here that's in front, that plays the same role as Newton's gravitational constant, capital G, only this is the electrical version of it. By the way, this number here is about 20 times or 20 orders of magnitude larger than capital G. The electric force is like 20 orders of magnitude stronger than the gravitational force. Gravity is the weakest of the four fundamental forces, by far. Electrical forces dominate the universe. Okay, so it's kind of annoying to deal with this one over four pi epsilon naught here, so we usually squish all of this guy here, this entire fraction, into one constant, and we just call it k, and it's about nine times 10 to the ninth. 
Remember, we're talking about forces here, so our final units will be in newtons. Okay, what if we have a bunch of charges all glued down in place? So all these guys here, Q1 through Q8, they're all glued in place. If they weren't, they would fly apart, right? If they're all positive, say. Then we bring along this charge here, this capital Q, and we want to know what's going to happen to him if I just set him there and I let him go. Well, he's going to feel a force from every charge that exists already. And the total force on him, just like we did in Physics 1, we would just find each force as a vector and add them all up. It's called the principle of superposition. These forces add as vectors. And that's what this statement right here says. Okay, so here's a good example. We've got all these charges. So Q1, Q3, they're glued in place. Notice that Q1 is a positive charge, 2 and 3 are both negative charges, and they're all multiples of our fundamental charge that we call little e, the charge of a proton. Char e in absolute value is the charge of an electron. Okay, so if we want to find the total force acting here on charge 2, we would find the force from charge 1, the force from charge 3, and we would add those together. Okay, so let's just look at our picture here for a second. Remember, 1 and 3, they're glued down. They're not allowed to move. I'm trying to figure out what's going to happen to charge 2 here. So 1 and 2 are opposites. 2 is going to be attracted to 1. So F of 2 acting on 1, that's what this means, will point straight up. If we were to let this guy go, he would try to go up and hang out with Q1 because they're opposite charges. 2 and 3 are likes. They're going to repel. Opposites attract, likes repel. So 2 is going to try to run directly away from 3. So this is the force of on 2 from 3. These two forces are vectors. We're going to find those vectors in component form, add them together, and then our net force then will point at some angle here, and we're going to find that angle as well. We're going to find the magnitude of the net force and the direction. Okay, so first we need magnitude of F21. Let's find this guy. Remember, we never ever plug in negatives or positives into Coulomb's Law here. Don't worry about the signs, the pluses and minuses. All we're finding here is the magnitude of this force. So K was 9 times 10 to the 9th, 8.99 times 10 to the 9th. Q1 was twice E, so we had that previously. That's this number. Q2 was 3 times E. Again, I'm not plugging in negatives here. And the distance between them, we were given this, was this distance here. That's going to be squared. So we plug all that in, we get this number, this tiny little force. Now we have to write that as a vector. So we look at our picture. We know from the picture that 2 is going to be pulled straight up in the y direction toward 1 because these are opposite charges and opposites attract. So this formula did not tell me that. It didn't tell me anything about direction. This only gives me magnitude. From the picture, I can see the direction. So as a vector, that will be the vector 0 in the x and all of it in the y direction. So there's f2 from 1 as a vector. 
Now we play the same game, two from three. The force on charge two from charge three. And you might be thinking, yeah, but charge three wants to run away too. Yeah, but that for the purpose of this problem, we've got one and three are glued down. We're holding them in place. Two's the only one we're going to let move. Okay, so we need to find this guy's magnitude. So that's just, we follow Coulomb's law here. We plug in all the numbers. We get this number that's always going to be a positive. Coulomb's law is always going to spit out a positive because magnitude is always positive. Now I look at the picture and figure out how to write that as a vector. That vector points directly along the negative x-axis. So that would be a negative x component, and in this case, a zero y component. It's not pointing in the y direction at all. So here's that vector as a vector in component form. He's got a negative, that amount, of negative x comma zero. I got that negative from the picture, not from the formula. Okay, then the net force, we just add these up. Add the x components, add the y components. The same thing you did in Physics 1 when you were adding forces. These are just forces. They're Physics 1 forces. Add the x's. So that x plus that x, that y, plus that y. Here's my net force as a vector. Now, that's a vector. It has a negative x component and a positive y component. That's exactly what I expected. If I were to pull on this guy this way and that way, it would end up moving here diagonally. It will have a negative x component and a positive y component. So that's to be expected. If I wanted to figure out how strong that was, i just find the magnitude. We know how to do magnitude of a vector. That's just Pythagorean. Be careful, a lot of mistakes happen here. When you're using Pythagorean, a negative squared is a positive. Notice I didn't put negative 2.6 right here, 2.16, because it doesn't matter. A negative squared is positive anyway, so don't worry about the negative when you're using Pythagorean. So you could type that in your calculator yourself. We get about 4 times 10 to the negative 14th newtons is my magnitude of the vector. What about the angle, where it's with our direction? Well, I could look at this picture here. Here's my net force. He's going to have some positive y, some negative x, and I could find this angle here using trig. We took an entire semester of trig. We know how to use trig. I could say, for example, that phi some angle is the inverse tangent of the y component over the x, but if you do that, you're going to get the wrong answer. Inverse tangent on your calculator will always spit out angles in quadrants 1 and 4, between negative 90 and 90 degrees. Your calculator is a liar when it comes to inverse tangent 50% of the time. It gave me an angle down here. It gave me negative 58 degrees. I then have to either add 180 to that to get this angle from the positive x-axis. I could do that. Or I could just use vertical angles here and realize, oh, that means this angle here is a 58 degree angle clockwise. So, Always remember, when somebody asks you for direction of something, you can never just say 58 degrees. 58 degrees from what? You always have to give an angle from some fixed direction. So here we would say 58 degrees from the negative x-axis. I would have said 58 degrees clockwise from the negative x-axis. Okay, this was a very important video, maybe the most important of the entire semester. Make sure you understood everything in it.